Good morning. God bless you all this morning as we worship our Lord together. Welcome to all of you in our sanctuary this morning, those in the parking lot, those joining us by way of Facebook and uh, TV as well. God bless each of you. Our theme this morning is going to reflect on this person named Melchizedek. You're going to hear that name a lot in our sermon and even in uh, some of our hymns. Uh, so hopefully you uh, come to know a lot about that person. Let's begin then with our opening hymn, which is Christ the Word of God Incarnate.
begin our worship with the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy. And for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this your confession, I by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our intro it. Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people. From the deceitful and unjust man, deliver me. I love the Lord because he has heard. My voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pains of death laid hold of me. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. For you have delivered my soul from death. My eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people. you. And let us pray. Almighty God, by your great goodness, mercifully look upon your people that we may be governed and preserved even evermore in body and soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. may be seated. Our Old Testament lesson is written in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their forefathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people, and no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. This is the word of the Lord. Our New Testament lesson is written in the book of Hebrews, chapter 5, and I read verses 1 through 10. 
For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when, God, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. And he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being destined by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. This is the word of the Lord. And in honor of the gospel, if you're able, please rise. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the first chapter. Actually, it's from Mark, isn't it? Mark chapter 10, verses 35 through 45. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right and the other, and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the Gospel of the Lord. And let us make the good confession of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified who spoke by the prophets. 
and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Congregation may be seated as we sing our sermon hymn, Christ Sits at God's Right Hand. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. My sermon this morning is based on that text from Hebrews chapter 5 and those words, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Well, as I've been reviewing this sermon and practicing and going over it over and over again, I realize each sermon is different, and this sermon is different too. 
as I review it, it's much more of a teaching sermon. And some of you might find that pleasurable, and some of you might find that really boring. Hopefully not too many of the latter. We're going to learn about Melchizedek today. Who is that person in the Old Testament, and how does it relate to Jesus in the New Testament? Melchizedek. I don't know how many of you already know that name. Maybe a few of you do. Maybe a few of you have read Genesis lately, that book of Genesis, and, and you remember, yeah, I came across that name in that book. Melchizedek. I think of that name. It's a very unique name. You're not probably going to find it in a baby book. You know, those books that they have where when you're going to have a baby and you page through it, you think, well, that name looks nice and that name sounds nice. And I bet you you won't even find the name Melchizedek in there. I have yet in my life, in all my years of ministry, to have uh, young parents come up and say, Pastor, we'd like to baptize our baby at church. And I get out my pen and my paper to write down the name, and they say, and I say, what's that baby's name? And I have yet someone to say, Melchizedek. I probably would drop my pen. Melchizedek. But maybe somewhere, sometime, someplace, there will be that baby that comes and the parents say, we're going to name that baby Melchizedek. And I think to myself, well, Grant, maybe the good Lord's saving that for a grandchild of yours. Melchizedek. Wouldn't that be a nice name on the side of a desk in kindergarten? Remember when you were little children in your first day of school and the teacher would put your name <clears throat> on a piece of paper, real fancy, and put it on the side of the desk? Do you remember those days? And you'd come into the classroom and you'd want to see, where is my desk going to be? And then you'd discover where your desk was, where the teacher wanted you to be. I was always smack in the front. <laughs> that teacher probably knew I better not put him in the back. He's already got learning problems. So he's going to be awful back there. Melchizedek. Well, let me explain what that name means and get into the heart of my sermon. It is a Hebrew name. And it's two words that come together. The first part of the word is melech which in Hebrew means king, melech. And the last part of the word is zadok, which means righteous. So you could put those two words together, a righteous king. And we're told in Scripture that he ruled a city called Salem. That word means peace in Hebrew, shalom. Peace. And eventually that city becomes called Jerusalem. And that prefix means the foundation. The stone that is laid that causes peace. And you might think of that in your own life. If you want peace in your life, if you have a beef with someone else, it might be that you need to be the person who cast the first stone, the stone of peace. Jerusalem laying that foundation stone. Melchizedek was the king of that place. And this is the general story of Melchizedek. He's sort of an en enigma in Scripture. An enigma, a mystery. The story is this Abraham. Abraham had a nephew named Lot, and Lot went to live in the city of Sodom because he saw that that area was very lush for raising his sheep. 
and Abraham went to live in a different area. Well, Lot made a bad choice, didn't he? If you know something about Sodom, it was not a very nice city. It looked nice. The grass was green, everything looked lush. But Scripture tells us the eye can be deceiving. It was not a good place. Eventually, the story will continue of Abraham having three visitors that are going to come and check out that city because the outcry has ascended up to God and God is going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But that hasn't happened yet. Lot is living there. It happened that the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah and <clears throat> some other kings... They rebelled against those who were ruling over them. Five kings against four. And a great battle ensued. Well, the king of Sodom and king of Gomorrah and their group of kings lost. They were rebelling against their overlords and they lost. And as those two kings Sodom and Gomorrah tried to run away. We learn they fell in tar pits. The Dead Sea area has lots of tar pits. And they died. Probably a good thing. Maybe they even fell into those tar pits on purpose. Better to die that way than to die at the hands of the man you tried to defeat and now he has defeated you. You can imagine the torture that you might be subjected to. Well, those kings came that won and took captive everything they could and headed off north towards Syria. Lot was part of those captives. Abraham heard about it. And Abraham gathered his forces. Abraham was a man of peace, but he was not a pacifist. He had a military force he put together of 318 men. And they went after him. They pursued him all the way up to a city called Dan, which is the northern part of Israel. You're just about ready to leave the land of Israel. Caught him at the border. And there he defeated those kings. And he rescued his nephew Lot and all the others. Well, on his way back home, he passed by the city of Jerusalem, which would have been on the way. And out came this king, Melchizedek. And he came out to him carrying bread and wine to bless Abraham. And he said these words to Abraham, Blessed be Abraham by God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies from into your hands. And scripture tells us Abraham at that point gave to that king a tithe, 10% of all of his possessions, an offering and that's where it ends. Melchizedek is the sort of character that comes on the scene with no history, has this little vignette in Scripture, and then sort of disappears again. Melchizedek. David will write about him a thousand years later. David, the king in Jerusalem, will write these words in one of the Psalms. He will say, The Lord has sworn and he will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And the Lord is at your right hand. Moses. Moses, who lived 500 years after Abraham, led the Israelites out of the wilderness didn't he? Out of Egypt and into the wilderness. And there he organized the Israelites with a priesthood. His brother Aaron was to be the first high priest. And all priests then would descend from 
Aaron's line. Their job was to be a go-between. And their job was to do what God told them to do. God had given instructions on how the Israelites were to worship and what sacrifices were to be formed on certain days. And that was their task as priests from the tribe of Levi. But Melchizedek was not from the tribe of Levi. And Melchizedek was never forgotten. His priesthood preceded that of Aaron's. And besides this, this priest was also a king. A king of righteousness and a king of peace. And so we come to the New Testament. And we have the writer of Hebrews writing to Hebrews. A word associated to being a Jew. Abraham was first called in the Bible a Hebrew in the story of him rescuing Lot. That's where he is identified as a Hebrew. Well, the book of the New Testament, the book of Hebrews, is all about Jesus being our high priest. The one who goes to the cross to sacrifice himself for each and every one of us to take away the sin of the world. And the writer of Hebrews says that priest is a descendant not of Aaron, but of Melchizedek. That Melchizedek is a foreshadowing of Jesus himself. That Melchizedek and Jesus are one in the same. Jesus is righteousness. Jesus is peace. And his sacrifice takes away the sin of the world. We call that, as we study scripture and study our catechism and theology, we call that the sacrificial theology of Christianity. That Jesus is our high priest who makes atonement for us. And his offering is everlasting. There's no need for any others. He is it. The author of Hebrews says, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who hear and listen to him. Listening. For a Hebrew, that word would have significance. Because it's the first word of all of the Ten Commandments. Shema. Listen, Israel. The Lord thy God is one. And then becomes the listing of the Ten Commandments. So the author of Hebrews, writing to Hebrew people, Jewish people, that knew well the Torah and the Old Testament theology of sacrifice, tells them, listen. Shema. Jesus is the source of eternal salvation to all who listen to him. In Jesus, we are at one with God. When I was a young person in confirmation, I remember my confirmation teacher teaching me that's the meaning of the word atonement. To be at one with God, washed of your sins, at peace with God through the righteousness of Jesus Christ that is transmitted to you, given to you. He is the king who comes and puts before you bread and wine. The holy sacrament. And we in return come forward like Abraham and offer our offering, our tithe. 
That's a lot of theology, I know, to soak in this morning. And, and you might think, Pastor, you got my head spinning a little bit. And, but it's important, I think, to let that sink in. To dig in deeper to God's Word. A lot of times we're very, how should I say, we are guilty of only dealing with things on a superficial level. And how sad that is to approach God's Word on such a super, on such a, what's the word I'm looking for? Superficial level. God's Word becomes much more enjoyable and much more meaningful to you when you dive in deep. Melchizedek, Christ, coming together. It's important to our development of faith to dig in deeper. This theology of sacrifice, it helps us understand why did Jesus die for us? Why did God demand such a sacrifice? And why would that sacrifice take away my sin? Unless you think, well, that's just that and it has nothing to do with anything current in the world today. you would be mistaken. God's word is always current. You have been called. You have been anointed. It's the meaning of the word christened. And priests were anointed. You are a priest in Christ. Anointed to live your life as a sacrifice to him and his kingdom. It's true Christianity is about receiving. It is. But it's also about giving. Giving of yourself, your tithe, your offering, your gifts that you have to give, your talents, your time, your treasure, we say in the church. It's you serving as a priest. Peter will write later in Scripture, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You are God's special possession. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. Amen. Will the congregation please rise? The peace of God which far surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the one true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. Let's sing together the words of the offertory. You may be seated, and at this time in our worship, our offering to Christ is received. We give thee but thine own, whatever the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. And would the congregation please rise for our prayers of the church. 
Gracious Lord, we come to you in prayer and worship you. We give thanks that you sent your only begotten Son to redeem us, to wash us of our sins, anoint us with your word and sacrament, and make us children of God, even a royal priesthood. We pray, dear Lord, that you would bless us as we go out into the world with bread and wine, sharing the good news, blessing your name and blessing your people. We pray, dear Lord, for those who would grieve on this day. In particular, we remember from our congregation the family of Christiana Johnson, particularly the Kaler family from our church. <clears throat> As they grieve her passing, may they be comforted that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that he has prepared for us a home in heaven. We pray for those under doctor's care, for Betty House and Orange Schultz and Simi Vogel, and also Lisa Cole's sister Debbie. We pray, dear Lord, be with each of them according to their need. We keep in our prayers our confirmands, Addison and Shelby, as they prepare for Confirmation Sunday. And we rejoice with those who rejoice in grandchildren, great-grandchildren. We rejoice with Lee and Judy Kassman at the birth of a great-grandchild, Adeline Grace. We continue always, Lord, to keep in our hearts and our minds our shut-in and nursing home and assisted living home members. We pray blessings upon our LWML and our LLL ministries in our congregation, our men and women's ministries in our synod. And gracious Lord, we pray bless the congregations of our church body as they proclaim your word on this day. These things we pray as well as our private prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue our worship with the preface, The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying... Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
our Lord Jesus Christ on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said take eat this is my body which is given for you this do in remembrance of me in the same way also he took the cup when he had supped and when he had given thanks he gave it to them saying drink of it all of you this cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you for the remission of sins this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me the peace of the Lord be with you always.
you're able, if you please rise, we'll sing the Nook Demitus. Give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Let us pray. We give thanks to Almighty God that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. And receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And we sing our closing verses of our hymn, Christ Sits at God's Right Hand.